I think we're ready to begin. I'm going to retitle this message, Remnant Character. Remnant Character. Well, I, I really believe that if you understand who the remnant are, and all that that entails, you might very well say to yourself, wow, what a bunch of characters. <laughs> and they are. The, the disciples were a remnant character of people. Not everybody fits into that category of a remnant, as we discussed last week, right? I think it was quite a revelation for a number of people. Uh, upon hearing that particular message. I believe that we are part of the remnant. And you cannot be a part of the remnant unless you have a deep love and respect for the Lord Jesus Christ and His kingdom. If you just call Him Lord, Lord, and you have a surface understanding of who Jesus is, then 90% of the Word of God is pretty much void to you. You really are lacking in true biblical understanding if you don't understand that, well, first of all, 71 to 79% of the Bible deals with government. Only about 21% of the Bible deals with our personal life. And I'm not saying that our personal life is not important. It is, it is extremely important. And that is what catapults us into deeper understanding and deeper things of the kingdom. But you have to have that personal relationship right and in order with Him and that vertical relationship. And then outwardly, uh, all things will come together for you spiritually. Uh, so I would implore all of you uh, that are listening especially right now to this particular message that if you do not have a close personal, real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to do so. How many people would agree with me on what I just said right there? How many would say that that is the most important thing in this life? And you miss out if you don't understand that. And I'm not talking about some Billy Graham walk. Right? I'm not talking about just come down the aisle, sign a book, get on the membership here, and, and hey, you're in. You're in like Flint. No. It means understanding that you are a created individual and that you were created for a purpose by a divine creator. And that divine creator is not Buddha. That divine creator is not Muhammad or any of the other false religions that exist out there, you were created by the true Creator who actually tells us that we were created. And we are all created for a purpose, no matter who you are. But there are categories, and there are, um, uh, certain, there are special conditions that are given in the Word of God concerning the callings. And we, of course, here teach the Israel calling, the Israel covenant calling for His people. And we believe it is important for His people, whoever they are, we'll get to that in a moment, to know that and understand that covenant calling and to walk in that light. I don't know why it is and how we got to the point that people are so blind to the biblical covenant understanding. How can that happen? How could, it, how could we become so blind about the importance of covenant? It, is, it, is, it, is, it will rejuvenate, it will revitalize, it will renew if you Understand the true covenant, true biblical covenant walk. Our nation 
was revitalized and given a rebirth, in a sense, when our Christian pilgrim Puritan forefathers came over here and they, one of the first things they did was establish covenant. And they, they gave this nation, because of what they did in faith, a covenant purpose. And so my question to you, and moving ahead rapidly, is do you have that covenant purpose and do you have that covenant understanding? The remnant have that. The remnant people have a covenant understanding, and it is very vital to their nature and character. You cannot progress as a Christian and not have that understanding. You can be a Christian, but you will be a nominal surface Christian who will not progress in the deeper things of God, especially in His kingdom understanding, if you do not have that covenant purpose behind your walk behind your life, behind what you think, and how you interpret God's Word. Now, our nation's in trouble. Back at the time of Isaiah, and he was dealing with, in, a, in many ways, the very same problems that we're facing today as a people and as a nation. Believe it or not. There was idolatry, there was sin, they had entered into heathen treaties and heathen contracts? Are we suffering because we have entered into heathen covenants and made heathen covenants rather than biblical, godly covenants of, God, of a godly design and purpose for the blessings of God to flow in an Abrahamic spirit and an Abrahamic faith which caught God's attention? We are to have faith. You cannot have a true Christian walk in Christ and not have faith in Christ and walk in that faith in Christ and, and have that light and truth coming and empowering you, if I dare say, and not in a New Age way, but in a biblical way, empowering you as a Christian. Let us turn to begin here in Isaiah chapter 2. I think you'll get the Biblical gist of this. Isaiah chapter 2. First off in verse 1 it says, the word, of the, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So here we have the setting. It's for the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern house is already in Syrian captivity right now. Right? And... Uh, Judah, are they any better? Can you really say that the southern kingdom of Judah, they're better because God didn't divorce them? No, they're, they're living in a, in, a, in, a, in a sinful, idolatrous way. Uh, they're in a covenant-breaking relationship with God Almighty. All right, and then it goes on and talks about the a kingdom, how blessed it is when the Jacob Israel people walk in covenant with God Almighty. This is a kingdom relationship that is talked about in these, in these verses. As an example, in verse 3 it says, And many people shall, come and shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will teach us in His ways, and we will walk in His paths, for out of Zion the kingdom shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now people look at this and they say, oh yeah, the, the word of the Lord is going to go forth from the old Jerusalem. Uh, yes, if you're listening to John Hagee and you have an old covenant understanding of this, but it's talking about prophetically here, the new Jerusalem. People are talking about the end times again and... Uh, the what's going on in, in Syria and the battle that uh, they believe is going to come about. Many believe, actually, that this is Armageddon. Armageddon. If you go to the book, uh, it, it, there's, there's verses on this which talk about um, Gog and Magog 
And when you read those over, and I'm not talking about Ezekiel 30 and 30, it's talking about actually what is going to happen uh, after Christ returns. That there is going to be a thousand year period of time that we're going to go through, and then there's going to be an unleashing of, let's say, Antichrist powers, which is hard to understand. But what it shows me is that it's like in our life, God Almighty always tests His people and proves His people. And there are spiritual reasons why that has to happen. But I would suggest to you that what we're seeing right now is not Armageddon. I, I would suggest to you that this is not World War III that is going to be upon us. In the sense of, of what we think of, of a world war and all nations fighting against each other, Russia, China, and really, when you read those scripture verses, who are they coming against? Just uh, You don't need to answer that, but I'm just posing a question right now. And I'm not going deep into this, but I'm just giving some surface biblical understanding here. Who are they coming against when people talk about this World War III or Armageddon? They're coming against Israel. Quote, Israel. And how do people interpret Israel today? The Judeo-Christian world says, oh, they're the Jews. And that's right. They're all, this war is all going to center around Jerusalem. They're going to attack Jerusalem. And, 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 and then right at the very last second, God Almighty is going to come and deliver His people. He's going to deliver the old Jerusalem. The kingdom will flow forth from Jerusalem. There will be thousands of converted Jews, 144,000 at least, they say, who are going to go forth in a Billy Graham crusade type message and save the world. Am I making this up, by the way, or am I? That's exactly how they believe. Are you kidding me? Are you, you, are, can you be serious? If, you're, if you really believe that, that God, hear the Antichrist, who hate Jesus Christ, and God says, don't even bid people like that, God speed. And God warns us in the book of John about those who have an Antichrist spirit. We are to stay away from, we are not to support, we are not to be a part of that Antichrist spirit, but Judeo-Christianity says, no! We know better than God's Word. We want you to be a part of it. We want you to send your money. We want to help the Jews and be a part of Judaism. So we're going to link ourselves with them, call ourselves Judeo-Christianity. And they do, of course, today. And that is Antichristism. They've attached themselves to the enemies of Christ. Now, when I say that to the average Judeo-Christian, what, what happens to those words I just said? They go in one ear and out the other. And they immediately respond with, that's hate. That's anti-Semitic. They don't stop and think, wait a minute. What he just said and what he quoted and what he said, it was absolute pure biblical truth. Now, Russia and them are going to attack Israel. China is going to attack Israel. That the Savior of Israel, of the old Palestine over there, is going to be the good old United States. Good old United States who allows women in the military today, who puts women on the front line now and says it's okay to allow homosexuals to be married and homosexuals to be a part of the military to allow all these heathen religions in here and bring a spirit of true antichristism into our nation to remove Christ from our schools, remove the Bible, remove and attack Christianity with government money, government funds at your tax dollar supported. They take from you, they steal from you at the power of a gun. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, if you don't pay your taxes, they'll come at you and throw you in jail. They'll take your property from you. They are supporting the Antichrist, but, oh, our nation is so godly, they say. Well, it was 
way more godly 100, 200, 300 years ago. As time has progressed since our forefathers come, have come, we've been, gotten progressively worse and worse because we were controlled, our politicians and the people and many corporations by a spirit of antichristism. And by that, it, it, we're talking about the love of money and the, and the manipulation of that money to gain control and to give them power over us through their laws and their policies and their treaties. It's all been for unjust gain to bring us under antichrist domination. That's over most people's heads, what I just said right there. I don't know why. All they have to do is a little bit of research on it. And so what I'm telling you is, Christians out there, even Judeo-Christians, you have a false, wrong understanding. Okay? Now, I'm not here with a baseball bat to beat you up over the head, maybe verbally. But I am saying this in love. Please do some more research and thinking on your position. Don't just sit back and say, oh, that Pastor Barley's a hate monger. He obviously must be because the media tells me people like him are. Or the, or the NAACP, or the Southern Poverty Law Association, or, you know, whatever out there. What is it, APAC? Uh, the, the strongest Jewish Zionist lobbying power in, well, in the world. But over our nation. Now, so we've got to get an understanding here of, of what's happening here now. This is Judah again. It's, it, it comes in and it talks about the way of salvation, the way to correct our nation, the way to have blessings in our nation is doing what these verses say here. And this is exactly what our Christian Puritan pilgrim forefathers did for this nation. And as I've told you, and I will continue to tell you, we are still living off the residuals of those godly principles they laid out and established for this nation. Thank God for them, or we'd be in much worse shape than we are today. And the way to get back to health for our nation is to go back to doing what they did, which means come out of her, and our, and our forefathers did that. They came out of polluted England. Yeah, I know all about the Christian history of England and everything, but they became polluted just like we become today. Is there any new land that we can go to? Well, yeah, Pastor, I think I saw on the Glenn Beck show we can go to Belize and buy uh, that land of Belize over there they're promoting and want you to buy some real estate over there and uh, that's where we can go and escape all this. These people that want to go to uh, other countries, well, let's just say you go to South Africa, or uh, not Africa. No, that would not be a good idea. <laughs> not, not with, <laughs> they're in worse shape than we are. We're talking about jumping from the frying pan into the fire. Uh, South America, though. You could probably go to some places over there and be relatively okay. But I want to assure you, and I've talked to people that have been over there, they tell me, that it is extremely dangerous in South America. I've talked to people that have been over there in a lot of different areas. They say, absolutely, you can go to certain places and you will be fine. But there are far more bad places over there that if you go into, you, your life is in jeopardy. So I'm just warning you right now, be careful what you think about leaving America. There really is no place for us to go to. The next world ruling empire is going to be the kingdom of God. I want to show you that. Uh, when that is going to happen, I don't know. But I think it might be quicker sooner than what a lot of us think that it is. But I'm not setting a date, right? But our nation's in trouble. In a way, this is warfare. Well, what kind of warfare? No, I'm not asking you to go out and grab your guns. But I am asking you to pray for your nation. I am suggesting to you 
No, I'm not suggesting. I am out, out, outright telling you that we can engage in warfare, spiritual, real spiritual warfare for our nation interceding. Do you want me to pray for Obama? Um, that's kind of a, that, that would take some explanation right there. And I don't have time to really get into that one. But I will tell you right now, what does God's Word tell, tell me and you, biblically, about that spirit of Antichrist? Do I bid him Godspeed? Are you, are you convinced, Pastor, that he really is an Antichrist? Yes, I am convinced that he's an Antichrist. I don't even, I think he is lower than a Muslim. He said, I, I think he's Muslim. Well, that's fine, but I think he's even lower than a Muslim. I think he's a blatant communist. I think he's a red, antichrist, communist-minded individual who hates our nation, who hates Christianity, and is doing everything in his power with his administration to destroy it, and it's only by the grace of God we're holding by a few strings right now. Threads, maybe. Now, I want you to bear this in mind as we're going to go into this, because all this is about, we have to have remnant character like our Puritan pilgrim forefathers had. You got the point now? We have to have that, and we have to engage in remnant biblical character. Do you have the character to pray? Do you have the character that will extract Bible light, Bible truth, for you as an individual, for your family, for your community? Do you have the vision that can build upon kingdom principles and kingdom living that we so desperately need right now for our nation? I believe that there is power in the remnant. And I believe that the remnant people can come together and perform and do great things for the advancement of the kingdom of God and for His righteousness. And then we've got to do them. Now, we're going to learn some of these in this, but we're, we're only going to skim the surface again. So let's go to now verse 6. Or, or I'll, we'll move ahead to verse 5. It says, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And we read that and we say, oh, how wonderful, yes. And yes, that's what we've got to do. We've got to... Do we just stop right there and say... Now come Jacob, come children of Jacob Israel, let's walk in the light of the Lord. Oh yeah. Well then, well, what is the light of the Lord? Yeah, that's it. It entails a lot, right? And it, and it is spiritual. It's deep spiritual meat when we're talking about this light of the Lord. Is it just in one area? I could sit here and name probably 20 things for you that's about walking in the biblical light, right? You could too. Have you, fit, have you covered it all? No. Because there is such a thing, obviously, as spiritual direction. And that may, be, and it's obviously sometimes different for you than it is for me. And we want His will for our life. But there is an overall corporate body of, of Christ's will that we will all work together in, even though we may have different positions and different functions within the body of Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Thank you. Thank you. I see I have my congregation pretty well trained here. A few of them are not as perfect, but they're coming along. <laughs> no. Uh, but let's move ahead now to verse 6. Therefore, thou who God Almighty is speaking of here, has forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob. Who's that? The, Jacob Israel. And um, at this time now, you can say that's the southern kingdom of Judah. But uh, he has forsaken the whole house of Israel in a sense. In that when they are living in an ungodly way, and they are behaving as the heathen, then... Uh, things aren't going to go well in that relationship. 
How can you expect it to? How can we as parents, as fathers and as mothers um, expect things to, uh, to go wrong and believe that things will not work right in our family if our children disobey us? And yet when it comes to spiritual things, well, oh, I don't see what problem God would have with that. Well, of course, the, 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 it's the family of God. He wants his children to obey him. And if they're not going to obey him, there's going to be problems. And that's what's happening here. Because they be replenished from the east. Are we being replenished from the east? Not from God, but from the eastern religions today? And they've gradually opened that door of the east more and more and more. So now what do we have? All these Eastern religions, the Buddhist religion, the Buddhist faith, uh, Hinduism. It is, it's growing and growing and growing. And paganism and heathen practices and this godless lack of moral biblical character is abounding in our nation today. Yesterday I was down in Spokane with my family and uh, we had to stop in at some clothing stores that Michelle needed to return some stuff to that she had uh, used and uh, they were going to offer her a little bit of money for it. So she got a little bit of money for her old clothes. So we stopped in there to drop those off. And I had been there about 10 minutes. I'm sitting in the car. My window was down on this side. And uh, uh, I'm not picking on them because they're Mexican, but these were Mexican women and they had their children coming outside. And they came outside and they were just yelling at that little girl and, and they were using foul, filthy, perverted language. I was just like, I'm looking over there. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. These poor little girls that they have to have parents like that to listen to that. And one of the mothers got in the back seat. Her daughter is coming outside. She went on that went on this side of the car. Her mother, I guess their mother, yelled some obscenities at her, and she just cries. She runs around to the other side of the car. The mother slams open the door, hits the girl in the mouth with that metal thing, and she's crying. And she says, "You get your little blanky blank blank. I can't even use the word." Into this car. I'm just like God. I can't believe this, and yet. What have we been reaping in our nation today? The look at look at look at the ingrained Hollywood Babylonian character that's ingrained in our people from their films, from their movies, from the uh, from our government that that um, tells us these things are okay. They do. They tell us that this lifestyle is okay. What are they doing in that? I'm going to redirect your thinking here a little bit. They're making laws. They're actually saying these are laws. These are principles that we deem are okay for you. You have the right to use all the filthy language you want to. Don't they tell us that today? I mean, you watch, you watch some shows and, and you can't watch them. I don't... You, you'd be more far safe to turn your TV off, obviously. But if you see any of these shows today, you'll see that, oh my God, the Babylonian filth and perversion that comes forth from them and the Antichrist uh, directed spirit of it all. The Antichrist way that they are allowed. That, but you cannot have true Christian Morality. You cannot have Christian teachings on the major uh, networks anyway. It's, it's, it's highly suspect if it's even on any of the other ones at all. And maybe to a low degree, yes, but I would say a lot of it is void of that. Because if you go too far in these Christian teachings, the thinking is they will shut me down. They will cut me off. They will not allow me freedom of speech. Do you think I could get on there and really teach what I'm teaching today, in this sermon even, without experiencing 
negativity and even threatening of shutting me off from those who control that Judeo-Christian channel. But as long as I go up to a a certain point and don't cross it, I'll be okay. Now, we've got to be fruitful and multiply in the Christian faith, in the kingdom knowledge and kingdom truth. We have to do that. In other words, we, this, this, this uh, planet, let's just take our nation, is starving to be replenished with this God knowledge, blessed God knowledge and truth. We, you and I, have that responsibility to live it and give forth that. Now, God can change this nation, and I believe ultimately will change it with just a remnant. When and how, you know what, I like to tell people, it's not up to you. It's up to Him. Well, I did it. You know, I I obeyed God, and I've been believing the kingdom message. I've been teaching. Whenever I get a chance, I'll, I'll tell people everything. And God has to change His nation because of wonderful me. Yeah, because you got the wrong spiritual attitude and motivation, if that's what you really think. Wouldn't you love it if Jesus gets to the end there and tells us, well, you're, you're, you're not paying attention to me. You're not giving the kingdom truth the attention that it needs, so I'm not going to die upon the cross for you. Wouldn't you love that kind of an attitude? Or any of the other past leaders that God's called, it's always been a remnant, if they had thrown in the towel when things got rough. Oh, they went through discouragement, but they hung in there. God expects you and I to be faithful to the end, whenever that is. Right? Okay. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east. We've got to be replenished from God, right? He is the vine, we are the branches. And our soothsayers like the Philistines... And they please themselves in the children of strangers. Are we doing that today? I mean, and by the way, that gets into the issue of race mixing too. Right? But we're mixing even religion today too. Judeo-Christianity is exactly this. Though they won't want to hear that to Judeo-Christians but they're pleasing themselves in the children of strangers. They're, take, they're, they're blending themselves and mixing themselves with antichrist philosophies and religion. And why are they doing it? Well, this is the, the we need to be diverse. All of them, these Judeo-Christian churches today talk about diversity and the wonders and the blessings of diversity. And I'm going to have to get into this eventually here. But what another thing that they're doing is attacking biblical masculinity. Huh? I'm not saying there isn't a place for femininity, but I'm telling you there's a lack of biblical masculinity today. Of, of men behaving in an effeminate way, and they're being directed that way. They're being motivated to become and being effeminate. Just use your imagination a little bit on that. It doesn't take much, right? Verse 7, their land is full of silver and gold. Hmm. Their land is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasure. Their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands for which their own fingers have made. They're worshiping the works of the flesh. Where is our money coming from today? The printing press. And what what is that money? Quote, money which is not real money. It's debt, usury, money that is created by antichrists who hate this nation and are 
have actually brought this nation into this debt, usury, bondage system. But we have acquiesced. We have given in to them by our sins, by, by uh, pleasing ourselves, as it says, with the strangers or in the ways of the strangers, by embracing all these various forms of, of idolatry, in other words, substituting man's laws, man's principles, humanistic ideology, basically, and all of its corruption. We've been embracing it as being all things to all people. We can coexist and we can be happy without doing God's will. Oh, really? How happy are you today? Do you see people happy today? You, I don't see... I don't see happiness on the faces of the people out there. All right. So there is a spiritual condition that we need to concern ourselves. And the mean man bowed down, and the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them not. Now I want to ask you a question. Is, um, is Isaiah on drugs? Uh Maybe he was hitting the bottle a little bit too much. Uh, maybe he fell out of bed and hit his head, and he's not thinking clearly here. And so what he should be saying is, therefore, forgive them. Well, pastor, <clears throat> don't you believe in forgiveness? I absolutely do forgive and believe in forgiveness. But I think what Isaiah is talking about is biblical forgiveness. And, and I do not think that we should be walking around just simply forgiving for the sake of forgiving and allowing the sin to continue. And that's what we're doing today. And I think that's what Isaiah the prophet is saying. Well, am I right or am I right on that? The problem with our nation today is we do not know how to properly or biblically forgive. And by that, I mean we have to repent. We have to say, God, forgive us. And we have to do things in proper kingdom order. And you cannot have kingdom light and kingdom order and say, forgive and let the sin and let the idolatry and let the ungodliness that is destroying our nation remain without putting a stop to it. So when it comes to remnant biblical character, that is a major part of remnant biblical character that we have to have. And you have to be tough enough. I hope this doesn't go over some of y'all's heads, but you have to be tough enough to love God and allow His judgments to do the work that it is He's deemed and ordained for it to do for the cleansing of the nation. He's not going to cleanse his nation and live, leave the sin and idolatry that is destroying the nation there. But what are we getting this Judeo-Christian love, forgive mentality? Forgive and forget. Let bygones be bygones. That's no, not real forgiveness. That's biblical insanity and stupidity. Okay. And, and again... Therefore, forgive them not because of what we've just explained there. Wow. I don't hear that from many pulpits. Enter into the rock and hide thee in, in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. Okay? Enter into the rock. We're in tough times today. Our security is in the rock, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not putting our faith and trust in man. We're putting our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says here, And hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord, 
You have the fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. You're trusting, listen to me, you're trusting in His judgment to do the work that He's called and ordained His judgments to do. When His judgments were in the earth, the inhabitants learn, or His people learn, righteousness. That's what the Scriptures teach. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. <laughs> Can you imagine in God's judgment? It's coming, folks. The look on their face, that's going to be priceless. And it's not because we want to, but because we know it's coming. It's go it has to, and it will. And the uh, haughtiness of men, boy, we see a lot of that, shall be bowed down, because right now the terrors are what? Lifting their heads. God's people are humbling today. They're bowing in prayer saying, God, forgive us. That's what the remnant does. That's remnant character right now. Okay, or bow down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. These arrogant terrors, these ungodly people, in whatever shape, the wicked are going to be brought low. And um, again, I don't know when, I'm not saying any time, but it happened, it's happening all the time in lots of different ways, even right now, dear friends, and has been happening since the time of Adam. It's been happening all along. And it takes remnant vision to see these things and to actually have greater faith than the average person does out there. And if you're one of those that's constantly walking around in fear and fret, and wondering, when is this going to happen? When is that going to happen? You might be surprised that a lot more of God's work is going on than you may realize. So it is important to have biblical remnant character. Going back to let now to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. In that day, or in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And um, uh, this, when we're talking about the Lord sitting on his throne, I get excited about that because I start realizing that this is talking about His judgments and His glory, that He is working out His purposes. Understand, He is ruling from on high. Right now, whether if we understand it or not, or you understand it or not, He's working, He's on high, working out His purposes. Okay. Above it stood... I don't know, I'm hearing that noise all of a sudden. I think it's coming from that machine right there. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Sorry, we had a little interruption with the, some equipment over here. All right. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings with twain. He covered his face, two wings, and with twain, two, he covered his feet, and with twain, did, he did fly. Okay, so this is talking about some, this seraphim. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Some people want to know what this means, this seraphim. I would suggest to you that you get Pastor Richard Kirsch's talks from this last conference from Ezekiel. I'm not sure, both of them actually talk about this. You can see these uh, symbolic, the symbolic language referred to in the book of Ezekiel. And he gets into explaining that. And what he's talking about, really, in here, is that this is a type of the sons of God. So, one cry to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Wouldn't you love 
to hear those words shouted. Well, you are going to hear those words shouted. And it's going to be the remnant God, sons of God, anointed, prepared, spiritually ordained and prepared, that are going to go forth and have this high calling in Christ. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke, meaning this, this is holy incense, which means worship. It's filled with worship. And this worship is coming forth. This worship is powerful. This worship will actually change lives. Boy, we could stop right here and go into the power and the anointing that you can come upon God's people through worship. And man, oh man, like I say, it will change your life spiritually. And you don't even have, people aren't even aware of it. You don't have to be. It's like obeying God's law. You don't have to be aware of all the blessings that will come forth from applying His law. But great, wonderful benefits will, you will see realized when just doing that. Same thing with worship. When we come together and we're worshiping and the house, I don't even care if two or three, it's just two or three, and it's filled with worship, wonderful spiritual things can develop from that in a blessed, miraculous, far greater outreach ministry than what most of us understand. All right, so uh, there's this incense, or this worship. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There was a vision from this worship that you get, a spiritual, greater spiritual understanding that comes from this, or that can come from this. And it's changing Isaiah's life. There's a saying, seeing is believing, right? And oh boy, to see the holiness of God, to know His righteousness, to become aware of one's fallen nature and the voidness of, possibly the voidness of Christ in your life, to come to terms with your uncleanness is spiritually powerful stuff. Spiritually. And it has to happen. It has to happen. You cannot just go on your merry way as a Christian and not have this spiritual transformation. It's not possible. You must. If you want to use the term born again, you cannot be, quote, born again without having this powerful spiritual transformation take place in your life. And it must take place in your life. It may not come from listening to my preaching, and I'm certainly not boastful enough or arrogant enough to think that, and it doesn't matter to me. I do know through the foolishness of preaching, people's lives can be changed, but it can only come about through, through a rise of spiritual conditioning. A spiritual check that, can, that comes upon your life, it can only come about by this spiritual power, this spiritual, blessed spiritual pressure being brought to bear upon your life that changes your mind and causes a renewal. It's the only way. I would, I would to God that people understood the significance of what I just shared. And I know many of you do, but there's many out there that do not. And there's many out there that are walking around with just a surface understanding 
of the kingdom or a surface understanding of who they are and they have not experienced this um, pro profound anointing that is actually being talked about in these scriptures here. We must be changed. Our minds must be renewed. We must put on the mind of Christ. You cannot come on your own and with your own understanding because then you become little gods and you become actually false idols of your own self undoing and destruction. But don't worry. You doing that the Holy Spirit will eventually get hold of you and shake you to your very core. I know a lot of prayers went up for me that brought about change within my life that I wasn't aware of and I, I wasn't aware that something was about to happen big in my life many, many decades ago. But that's what happened to me. I'll bet the same thing happened to you and you probably weren't even aware of it. Maybe your mothers, maybe your fathers, maybe your friends, maybe somebody was praying for you along that line. Maybe you came and the word came and quickened your heart. Something happened spiritually, a key to unlock the door, to bring in Holy Spirit illumination, power, to make you a remnant, part of that remnant body, and you started developing remnant character. Remnant character is not running from the problem. Remnant character is running to God. Remnant character is putting your faith in Him, not putting your faith in man or man's systems or in wealth or whatever out, out there in a worldly, fleshly way, but it's doing the proper spiritual things that are going to make the main difference in your life. So, uh, that's what's happening here, and, and uh, in this, Isaiah came to know, as the scriptures say here, the Lord of hosts, and his uncleanness was exposed to him. Now, I want you to stop thinking about this. Who was Isaiah? Isaiah was a prophet of God. And actually, his own uncleanness starts oozing forth. There's pr spiritual pressure being brought to bear upon Isaiah, even in this, what we're reading here, that's bringing a spiritual awareness unto him that probably he was, I'm sure, was not even aware of that existed. His own uncleanness was being exposed by the light of Christ, that rock. In God's holiness, man can no longer hide from the uncleanness within him. Won't happen. Man's uncleanness is usually manifest in his own words. And this is what's happening for the nation of Israel, is it not? Are we a nation of unclean people and it's being manifest, think about it, in the fact that there's unclean lips, there's unclean words. Weren't we talking about that earlier? That's a big spiritual indication right there. Now, I uh, am going to have to stop there. My time is out today. But I want you to take these things to heart. I want you to pray about them because I'm, I'm giving you some serious spiritual meat here that I think can help a lot of you. And a lot of times it's just rehearing something that we thought we already knew but hearing it in a different way and it gives, bursts forth a blessed spiritual explosion of that, that will just bless us, that will help, help us move along spiritually in a deeper way than what we did before. And I believe that there's spiritual meat here for all of us that can help us in that area. It'll give us light concerning our nation that probably we hadn't considered before. But anyway, 
Here's the main thing. We need to seek remnant character. We need remnant character, Israel. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just come to you now in humility from this example of humility that actually the prophet Isaiah is experiencing himself. We're feeling that in our hearts and our lives right now. We feel what he felt for his nation because we feel it for our nation as well. We are identifying with the prophet Isaiah. And yes, we can point our finger at the world out there at its uncleanness. But that uncleanness and that vision and that understanding of it must come to bear and be realized within each and every one of us first and foremost. The turning begins with us, the remnant people. And we pray that you will help us. We pray that you will give us blessed spiritual light that can only come from you, the true light, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.